So with that, uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. Uh, thank you, Grant, for uh, introduction. So the topic of what I will be presenting is top-down modeling. It's the data-driven, purely data-driven reservoir simulation and modeling using AI and machine learning. And uh, I am part of uh, uh, West Virginia LEADS, which stands for Laboratory for Engineering Application of Data Science, given the fact that there is a uh, uh, big difference between the engineering application of AI and machine learning versus non-engineering application, and that's something probably that should be uh, discussed, but uh, without any starts, let me give you an outline. So I'm going to start with uh, giving you a, uh, a definition of TDM in a nutshell, one uh, simple uh, definition, and uh, then I will uh, start by giving you a summary of the capabilities of this technology and also its actual uh, validation, uh, not an academic validation, but the validation in the real world use cases, several, uh, the forecast optimization. Uh, I decided to do that first before going into details of its development because if a technology is not capable of doing certain things, uh, or at least claim it, can, it has these this capabilities. But then claims is one thing, but you have to actually do it and validate it, and by that I mean actually blind validation forecasting the future. And uh, Because once these two are there, then if people are interested, then they would be interested to see what this technology is. Because if uh, there is no validation of a technology uh, or what its capabilities are, then it really doesn't matter how it's developed. Uh, whether you share it or not, it's a completely different story. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but the key is the technology should be something that uh, its capabilities are of interest to uh, uh, scientists and uh, operating companies and the service companies in oil and gas industry. And then it has to be validated, the claims that are made. Uh, so after that, then I'm going to go and talk about the details of how it's developed. Uh, the key behind everything in top-down modeling is a spatial temporal database. Uh, literally, this is, and that's what I'm now calling it, the spatial, spatial temporal learning, because it's very different from all other applications of AI and machine learning. And of course, uh, then at the end, I'm going to show you one of the uh, recent use cases that we have done for one of the operating companies. And again, none of these things that I'm presenting here is academic. All of them is applied in uh, real world to <coughs> operating company all over the world, and I show them to you today. So with that, let's start with uh, uh, giving you the reservoir analytics. And I tell you why I call it the reservoir analytics, because it's applied both as a top-down modeling and as a spark smart proxy, and I'm going to give you that definition. But this technology, actually, its contribution is to reservoir management. And reservoir management needs tools that are accurate uh, and uh, has a high speed, uh, because the managers like to perform these analyses hundreds and thousands of times before making a decision. And the decision they make has to do with field development planning, uncertainty quantification, and production optimization. And what we have to work with in, in the industry, we, we have field measurements. These are the facts. These are the real stuff uh, that we have actually measured. Uh, things such as uh, seismic survey, uh, well construction, trajectory detail, well logs, core analysis, well test completion, and work over hydraulic fracturing, operational constraints, injection and production history. This is what we all get started with. But traditionally what we do is we build, uh, or we ask the uh, geoscientists and petrophysicists and geologists to build a geological model for us. And then we'll take that uh, geological model and we upscale it, or they upscale it for us, and we build a numerical reservoir simulation. Then we take that numerical reservoir simulation and try to uh, do reservoir management with it, but the fact is, if you have dealt with the operating company, you know that the, especially the big ones, which have teams of reservoir modeling and teams of reservoir management, these two teams, these two groups do not necessarily uh, speak in the same language. They don't necessarily uh, very much like each other. 
uh, and main, one of the main reasons uh, that reservoir management are very critical of reservoir simulation and modeling is because uh, the use of numerical reservoir simulation in reality not in the academia uh, or research, but, but in the operating companies, in the reality in the world. Uh, that's a pretty impractical, because in order to make a decision, you need, again, you have to run the model a very large number of times, <coughs> do uncertainty quantification, and find out what, what is uh, the optimization. And doing that using numerical reservoir simulation is really impractical. That's a real numerical reservoir simulation. Uh, situation which, uh, for a real field, it, it usually has uh, uh, tens of millions of grid blocks, and even if they uh, use the HPCs to do that, uh, uh, it's, it's, they cannot run it that many times. So anyways, with that uh, said, TDM, or top-down modeling, which I'm going to cover here, uh, goes directly from uh, uh, field measurements without uh, any other uh, step and uh, uses that in order to provide a tool for reservoir management. Of course, the same technology can be used in, uh, to develop smart proxy model. The difference is that instead of the data coming from the field measurements for smart proxy modeling, the data can come from numerical reservoir simulator. That you can run the model uh, about uh, 10 to 20 times, generate the data, use that data in order to uh, use that data in order to build your smart proxy and then your smart proxy actually can be run on a tablet or a, uh, and you can run it millions of times. And uh, of course it is possible to use uh, the geological model directly to build the TDM. We have done that uh, uh, before. Uh, one of the operating companies requested for us to do that. It was we were able to do that. And instead of going through a numerical simulation, you can use the geological model to build a smart proxy without any uh, uh, upscaling. That is also possible. So <laughs> these, these two technologies, which is TDM or SPM, is, uh, are the uh, petroleum data analytics. And that's, in a nutshell, what this technology is. So to give you one more, uh, a little more definition of that, TDM is <coughs> a reservoir management tool. Uh, it has very small computational footprint. It can be run on a laptop, or very soon, hopefully, it can be run on your smartphone. Uh, it's a tool that uh, is used for field development, including uh, uh, uncertainty quantification. And it, and it uses field measurement directly to build a and history match a, a top-down model and use it in order to perform all the things that I'm going to talk about today. So what are the unique characteristics of the TDM? The most important one is unlike uh, numerical reservoir simulation, which is a reservoir model, TDM is a coupled reservoir and wellbore model. And uh, for those of you who have been involved in using numerical reservoir simulation in a, in a real case simulation, uh, I think somebody that is on the phone needs to uh, mute their, their phone because we're hearing uh, anyway, so uh, the input to the top-down model is choke setting and or wellhead pressure or wellhead temperature or flow line pressure. Uh, that is unlike uh, numerical reservoir simulation that the input or the, what, what they use in terms of pressure is flowing bottom hole pressure, something that's hardly ever measured in, in real world. Uh, and oil production in TDM is the main output uh, uh, of the of the system, and the reason I say that is because for those of you who have been involved in numerical reservoir simulation, not in the academia and research, but in real world situation, you know that uh, that uh, 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 oil production during the history matching is an input to the numerical reservoir simulation. It is not an output. The output actually is flowing bottom of pressure because that is something that they do not have the option to uh, measure it all the time. Uh, other outputs of the uh, TDM uh, are uh, oil, gas, water production, uh, reservoir pressure, and water saturation, and those are simultaneous all at the same time. Uh, the next, next uh, key issue about uh, TDM is it, its history matching process is completely automated. Uh, there is uh, very little involvement of, uh, of the user. The history matching top-down model makes absolutely no assumption. It 
it makes no interpretation, and it makes uh, regarding geological characteristics that is measured. In other words, all the measured uh, values, uh, data, uh, which is mainly to a very large extent uh, seismic and uh, logs and uh, 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 core, uh, they, they are honored 100%. And of course, you can do uncertainty quantification afterwards. Uh, one of some of the questions that are usually asked, one of them is people, all, when I present this, they say, but the data that we use is uncertain and noisy. How can we use that data in order to build a model? Well, the first thing is the same is true about any other type of modeling that you make. Numerical reservoir simulation or RTA, you use the same data, don't you? Okay, so, uh, the, but the fact is, when you use uh, uh, the data from, uh, from the real world, and nature is always uncertain, and it's always noisy. That's a fact. Uh, but keep one thing in mind, that human brain processes real data all the time. And uh, uh, one of the most important characteristics of AI and machine learning is the fact that it's capable of handling uncertain and noisy data. Uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about outliers and some of the data that are quite wrong. Uh, we have to handle that. But in terms of noisy data and not necessarily 100% certain data, that is something that AI is capable of doing. Why? Because human brain does that all the time, and AI and machine learning are tools that mimic the way human brain deals with the data. Uh, that said, the next one is, uh, how do we know we have enough data to build a top-down model? Well, in a short, uh, simple sentence, I can say, if you have 30 wells in about three years of production, then you have enough data to get uh, TDM started. Uh, comparing numerical reservoir simulation models, how hard and time-consuming is the history matching of top-down modeling? As I mentioned, uh, it's uh, literally incomparable because it is completely automated, the history matching, and it can be done very, very quickly. In numerical reservoir simulation, uh, you can do modification, uh, which is global-based, uh, to, to, his, to history matching, and 99% of the time that doesn't work. It may uh, enhance the model a bit, but it cannot history match hundreds of wells that you have. Then you have the next step is regional modification, uh, reservoir compartmentalization and modification. That, again, takes you further closer, but 90% of the time that doesn't work. And uh, we all know that the numerical reservoir simulation, in order to get a history match, you have to go and do local and well-based modification, transmissibility changes and skin changes around the, each uh, single web board in order to, to accomplish the mm -hmm. numerical <coughs> history match. That does not apply to TDM. To TDM, the only thing you modify is a global modification, which is the whole thing. Everything that I'm talking about here in this uh, presentation in detail is presented in this book. This book was pre uh, published by SPE and all the details of how to develop uh, data-driven reservoir modeling can be found in this book. With that, let me talk about uh, what are the capabilities of, of TDM. First of all, let me let, uh, share with you that TDM has been applied to so many different fields all over the world from uh, U.S. to South uh, Central America to Europe, uh, North Sea, uh, a lot in Middle East uh, and then in Southeast Asia. So everything that I'm uh, telling, uh, presenting here to you is not theoretical, it's actually based on uh, actual uh, situation. So one of the first things is the results that you see here in history matching. One of the first things we do, we take the, the entire time and we divide it in two general pieces. The first piece uh, we use to do history match and then we, we put away a part of that uh, data and we call it blind history matching. We built a history match model from beginning to, to right here, let's say, and then we deploy it and we uh, forecast, TDM forecasts uh, the rest of the time, and then we have the results actually, and you can compare it. This is a, benign, this is a field, in, uh, uh, an onshore field in the Middle East, and uh, these are two examples of two wells that have been history match and blind history match uh, for oil production, reservoir pressure, and water saturation, and then this is the forecast part of it. And we call it validation in space and time. This is the validation in time, as you can see. But uh, this is two more wells that were drilled 
uh, after the time we used to history match. Therefore, that is not only validation in time, but also validation in space. These are two separate new wells. Another thing that you can do in real time, actually, on a laptop, uh, you can uh, you can uh, single parameter sensitive perform single parameter sensitivity analysis. You can change, uh, for example, here you're changing the choke setting from five to 125, and uh, just by click one button, you can see how oil, water, and gas production is impacted during the history and during the forecast for these different. Uh, 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 sensitivity of the model to these different choke settings. Uh, sometimes you want to do multi-parameter combinatorial sensitivity analysis. In this case, uh, another uh, well in the same field, uh, we uh, simultaneously did sensitivity analysis for four different parameters, completion, uh, pay thickness, permeability, and porosity, uh, given the fact that it is a multi uh, parameter uh, combinatorial sensitivity analysis. You have to do. Uh, uh, you have to perform this analysis literally tens of thousands of times. It, it, that cannot be done uh, in real time, but it only takes a couple of hours to do that, and it gives you a range of oil, gas, and water production in, uh, that that goes with. You can actually optimize water injection. This is a field that we did again for the uh, for the. Uh, uh, Middle East uh, from 1975 to 2014 that we did this uh, project for this company, we, we looked at their historical data and we identified that if they would have uh, 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 inject 15% less water than they actually did, they would produce 2% more oil. That 2% in that field, that's about 10 million barrels, a very, very large. Uh, and I'll give you ex examples of this uh, as we move forward uh, uh, in this presentation. And another thing that we can do very uh, easily this, with this technology is map the reservoir conductivity. That, is, that goes beyond uh, just permeability mapping. It is uh, when you talk about reservoir conductivity, specifically when you have CO2 or uh, uh, natural gas or water injecting uh, in order to enhance oil production, then you are combining uh, thickness of the formation, the permeability of the formation associated with uh, mobility of the of the uh, uh, mobility of the uh, fluid, which has to do with its viscosity and its impact of pressure uh, to it. As we move forward. What you can do, you can actually ident once you build the model, you can literally run it tens of uh, uh, thousands of times, even millions of times, in order to identify, for example, in this particular field in the uh, Middle East, again, uh, the ones in the middle, these are all producers, these are all injectors in a uh, periphery. And uh, what we were able to do, we run the model uh, tens of thousands of times and identify which, which injection well is contributing to uh, incremental production of oil and then identify which one is the highest contributor and which ones are the lowest contributor. Uh, the next item is, and that's the same thing that we I just showed you that we did, you can identify how injection of water or in the case that we are working with in this project is CO2, uh, how much CO2 you should in, inject in order to increase production if that's the uh, objective of CO2 injection. I'm going to go to the detail of this one in a little bit. Uh, and uh, this is then you can add uh, uh, economic to it and identify net present value of different WAG systems where you have uh, uh, water and gas or water and CO2 injection, whether you have three months each, three months gas, six months water, uh, three months uh, uh, WAG or three months each again, but the volume changes and, and so forth, and you can see the history match has been done, and this is the oil production forecasting and allows you to perform uh, net present value economic calculation. Another thing that you're able to do with this is choke setting optimization, because you cannot optimize flowing bottom of pressure in realistic fashion because you don't have any tools to measure flowing bottom of pressure, and there's a difference between the flowing bottom of pressure and choke setting and wellhead pressure, unless unless you put an equation there and you can change it the way you want. But uh, here is an example that tells you that the original uh, production of this particular well, as, as you can see 
here and optimize this. This that's the difference that you, you did, as you can see, GOR and water cut uh, does not change it. And here, what you can see is uh, uh, the, the line in the red is actually what you identified, how to optimize, change the uh, choke setting in order to optimize production. And you can see this is GOR and this is water cut, and this is the level that they don't have to pass, otherwise you cannot uh, open the choke to a certain amount. And uh, another thing that, that can come out of it is actually one of the things uh, that separates this technology from uh, our traditional numerical reservoir simulation is that geology a lot of time becomes an output rather than an input because when you talk about geology, there is a lot of interpretation associated with it. And since this is stays, this technology stays away from interpretation, so the output can be a uh, uh, and, and the, the geology uh, can be an output. This is an example that we did in this particular field. Uh, the historically, they that they injected. If you would have injected all of the uh, historical, uh, uh, you, you could see what happened to the uh, oil saturation. Where if you had uh, less injection, how would that impact the saturation? And I show you uh, how that actually impact. The, I, I mentioned that you had to. In this particular case, you had to inject 15% uh, less in order to increase production a bit, and I will I will show that in a few wells in, in a minute to you. What are the limitations of uh, TDM? It's only applicable to mature field. You cannot apply that to uh, uh, you cannot apply it to uh, uh, green fields. Uh, so you have to have field measurement in order for this to work. If you have green field, you have to use a smart proxy model. Not, uh, not, uh, that's still an AI uh, technology, but it is not uh, the TDM. <coughs> so uh, if you should have at least three years of uh, historical production. It is not valid once the physics of the fluid flow in the field uh, changes. In other words, for example, let's say you have the data only from primary uh, production, and now you want to see what happens if you inject certain things. Well, that changes the physics since you don't have the data for that. It doesn't work for that. You, you can build the model for primary and then uh, update it as you inject uh, after uh, six months, let's say, or depending how many wells you have, and then you can move on and use the, this, this technology. <coughs> so let me show you uh, some of the validation again. Because if, if uh, there, there's, as you probably say, it's, it's a lot of claim is being made. Uh, the key is, can, are these claims, can it be uh, uh, in realistic, in the real world situation, be tested to see if it works? This is an example I'm giving you. Uh, and I can actually show you the, the, the field. It's called Buhasa in uh, United Arab Emirates, ADNOC. Uh, they allowed us to, to share that, so I can do, do share it. I can tell you exactly what it is. This, uh, and uh, so the, they wanted, what they wanted to do five years after we built the model, they called us back in and they said, we're going to give you five, uh, 23 new locations for the wells that we drilled in the past five years uh, since the last time you performed this model for us. And the question we have, uh, they asked us was, if we give you the location, can you tell us when we drill these wells, what was the pressure and what was the water saturation that uh, uh, your model tells us uh, we would get at those locations? And uh, so it's uh, again, in the five years that the model has not been uh, updated. And this is the result uh, that they uh, actually shared with us. So they gave us those five different uh, uh, formations. Uh, they were the wells were drilled, drilled into, and, and this is the combination of these 23 wells. And when you look at it, and we, they gave us the location, we gave them the pressure, and they, they, they gave us the results. The results shows that about 35% of all the uh, TDM uh, uh, predictions were more than 90 percent accurate. The next 26 percent were between 95 to 90 percent accurate. Another 30 percent were 90 to 80 percent accurate, and uh, 8 percent or 9 percent were between. Uh, so there was nothing less than 70 percent. So more than 90 percent of all the TDM predictions were m were more than 80 percent accurate on these 23 wells that uh, we did for this particular. Uh, and then we also did it for res uh, for water saturation, 
And this is a, the, the distribution of accuracy of our model. Again, this was five years without being updated. And this is 70% of the TDM predictions were more than 80% accurate. Uh, this is another one that I cannot tell you exactly where it is. Uh, this is in Caspian Sea. This is much, uh, uh, actually, only two years ago we did this. And we did choke setting optimization after building the TDM. And then they compared our prediction and they actually used it in the field. And they shared the detail with us. And I'm here uh, telling you the, the detail they had. They had two sets of it's the offshore. So they had two sets of wellhead, low pressure wellhead and high pressure wellhead. 19 of their wells uh, were flowing in the low pressure, the rest were flowing in the high pressure. And they asked us if uh, they gave us three wells, and they asked us how could we change these three wells. Uh, uh, they were originally uh, clicked in the high pressure. They asked us should they be, what, what do, should they do? We, uh, they actually gave us a lot more than that. Uh, and we told them these three should go be switched to the low pressure. And, uh, uh, and they did that, and uh, this was incremental oil production on a per day basis uh, for these three particular wells. And uh, which is about that uh, goes to about five million dollars uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so the change of the wellhead system did not neg negatively impact the GOR gas or ratio, water cut or reservoir pressure uh, to go below uh, uh, the bubble points for the gas to come out. So that was the key about the, these uh, uh, predictions. How you can, which wells you you open the choke to what percent uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, uh, that you still produce more oil without uh, changing the water cut and uh, and this is uh, then we had identified uh, four places for them to drill new wells and this is the email that they sent to us. I'm not showing you all the details, but it tells you that we would like to inform you that the results of prediction scenario of uh, this particular field indicated a good location for, for a, uh, this particular well, and it has been proven with completed new that. So they, they drilled it, and they, the result that they gave them, at least for these two, uh, they have done it, and they came up to the conclusion that it works correctly. Uh, then they gave us 15 wells, and they asked us to give, give them uh, optimization. Uh, of, uh, when, if, if they were in low uh, pressure or in high pressure, they wanted us, they want us them to tell you whether they should uh, switch it or, or keep it. And uh, these are these are the 15 that we asked them to switch from high to low or from low to high in order to change production, uh, opt optimize the production. And based on what they have uh, mentioned here, the result of 13 out of 15 uh, were correct. So 87% of the uh, uh, TDM choke setting optimization that was recommended after they tested came out to be correct. And uh, this is uh, the same field uh, that we forecasted in the back, uh, background, uh, green, uh, and, and then as you can see, uh, uh, this, the, this is a TDM forecast, and this is what actually what they were uh, produced, and they shared it with us, and you can see how good uh, uh, was the TDM's forecast. Uh, in terms of future, the only input was uh, uh, the choke setting that, that we got from them. So uh, that provides you with enough. So let me talk a little bit about how do you go and in detail and develop the TDM. Again, in that book, all the detail is, is, is provided. We start with only field measurement, uh, static data and dynamic data, from well trajectory survey to seismic and PBT and log. And the dynamic data operational constraint plays a very important role, all the injection and, and, and production data. We build what we call spatial temporal database. I'm going to explain it in a minute to you. And then we use that spatial temporal uh, database. We build a very general static model without making any interpretation. We use fuzzy pattern recognition in order to identify which parameters, uh, what kind of impact they have. And then we do all of that. And this is how we build the, uh, the TDM, the top-down model. It's a combination of multiple uh, neural network that are sequencing each other and feeding each other uh, one as, uh, as, as we move forward. This is, for example, this particular one has five different models that uh, cascading uh, one another. So once you do that, you have to validate it in time and space, as I mentioned earlier. If the validation doesn't work, then you need to go back to 
spatial temporal database and figure out what was it that you didn't do correctly in order for that happen. If it actually works well, then you can use it and run it literally millions of times in order to do production forecasting, sensitivity analysis, optimize infill location for a producer or injector, and uh, so forth. Uh, so uh, I'm sure uh, in uh, uh, other presentations that you were exposed to, the machine learning algorithm, the neural network is, uh, is presented to you. It's really not that complex, uh, so if the mathematics behind neural network is something you're interested in, it probably, as engineers, it's going to probably take you uh, a couple of hours to, to figure it out because the mathematics behind the overwhelming number of machine learning algorithms, the mathematics behind it, are very, very simple, uh, especially when you compare it to the some of the engineering detail that you have to deal with it when you are building the physics-based model. So uh, this is a simple neuron. The inputs go, and uh, you have a, a summation, which is a, uh, a dot product of the two vectors, and then it goes to an activation function, and then you come up, and this is the simple mathematics uh, that uh, provides you with the output, and then uh, what you have to do, uh, once you get the output, that's for a single uh, uh, neuron. Uh, in a, a complete neural network has a large number of neurons that goes, uh, inputs that goes to multiple neurons in multiple uh, hidden layers, depending on how you develop it. These are really, to be honest, is not, they're not that important because, why? Because the mathematics behind it is so simple. Furthermore, you can actually download uh, open source of these uh, algorithms so easily. So I, in, in a way, you shouldn't waste your time to become uh, an expert in the mathematics of uh, AI and machine learning. Even if you want to become, it's, it's going to take you a very, very short period of time to do that. But, and, and of course, once you have uh, uh, the output of the neural network, then you compare it in, in a, in a uh, uh, supervised learning, you compare it with the actual output that you have, and then you use uh, gradient descent or backpropagation or other algorithm, which essentially what you're trying to do is to identify how to minimize uh, the error through the gradient descent process. And again, I'm not going to give you uh, much, uh, to be honest with you, I don't want to waste your time on the mathematics behind it because I'm sure you all know it, and if you don't, it's going to take you very little to figure it out. Uh, for here now, when it comes to top-down modeling, it is all about how you use the data. And here I have uh, uh, the data that we use in order to build the numerical, uh, the, the top-down model from well data to completion data to reservoir data. And if you look at it, all of them are uh, measured data, none of them are interpreted data. And if available, all of this data we use, artificial lift is important. Every piece of information that you have is important. And these are the other things that if, if it is available to you. And again, another nice thing about TDM is there are not certain uh, parameters that if you do not have, of course, I'm not talking about the output or what you're trying to history match, but for example, if, if gamma ray is not available or if permeability is not available, it, it, you do not uh, fall apart. If you don't have permeability, you cannot run reservoir simulation model, uh, but you still can run uh, this technology. Why? Because it's not based on equation. So you take the, uh, all that data, and uh, you build uh, a, a very uh, a simple static model. You use the static data, you use the dynamic data, the seismic and all that. The phase one that, that, that you spend a very, very large amount of time is that data preparation, uh, data uh, QC and QA. Then you build the, compre the comprehensive spatial temporal database. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then you build the TDM. And as I mentioned earlier, you have multiple neural networks that cascading one another. You history match that, and you validate it in time and space. If you can, then you have to go through that process until that is done. When it's done, then you can use it and deploy it for field development planning and implement it in the field, get the data, re put it back into the uh, 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 comprehensive uh, spatial temporal database, and that is a circle that uh, can always be green and go. So the top-down model, is a, the structure of it is, uh, is, a, uh, is a usually determined by three factors. The main objective of the project, the size and the age of the field that being modeled, and the quality and the quantity of the data that you have. 
Uh, another set of things that you have to use is a, a series of intelligent agents uh, that's going to help you in order to make sure that many things that you are looking for are going to be used. So before, I have only very little time left. I cannot show you the uh, use cases, but let me tell you a bit about this uh, spatial temporal database. One of the, so let's imagine that this is a field, that that's, these are the wells that we have. The first thing we do, we build a Cartesian grid in, uh, in that, and then we identify the, uh, the outer boundary, and then we use Voronoi, uh, Voronoi graph theory in order to identify polygons for each well. One of the things that, that, the fact that you do that, you cannot do that for all the wells at the same time, because in the real world, you can never, if you have 100 wells, they, those 100 wells were not d d drilled all at the same time. They were drilled probably in 10 different phases at 10 different times. So if this is the phase number one, as you can see, the phase number one, you only have three wells. And when you do the uh, uh, Voronoi polygons, you have these areas associated with them. Then in phase two, now it was three, now you have four, uh, five, six, and seven. Uh, what happens now, it changes the area that each well is, uh, has the polygon. And when in the phase three, when you go, it again changes. So that's step number one. Step number two is we know that, uh, this is the same uh, example that you saw, uh, that in the reservoir, offset wells impact each other a lot. So if you're taking the two offset wells for each well, during the phase one, these two, phase two and three, are offset of number one. But once if you go to phase, the second phase, then the close well number four become closer than well number three. So instead of two and three now to this particular well, number two and four become the uh, offset wells. And later on, as you go to the next phase, then the same well uh, has four and eight as its two offset wells, if that's how many offset wells that you're looking at. So when you are building a spatial temporal database, even static information of W1, of well one or each well will change. Uh, if you go back and look at this, the, 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 the average value of porosity, gamma ray, uh, density, everything that you do for well number one, it changes as a function of time. We call this dynamically modified static information. And these information are going to be used because they're going to impact the production and the injection as a function of time. Well, and that's why they, they we call it spatial temporal. Another thing that we have to say is that uh, when you compare the TDM to the uh, uh, numerical reservoir simulation, the reservoir uh, simulation modelers may think that we're building, or they can mention it, that we're building sector models, which is correct. You actually, for every well, all the wells that are around it and are contributing to it, uh, to its uh, production, impacting it. Every time you build a model, that's how it is, and then you bring them all together, and the final model is that. And this is what I was talking about, the intelligent agents. The, the physics and geology-based constraint boundary conditions, uh, the reservoir management constraint, the GOR, or water cut, uh, and every other, the surface facility issues that you have, all of these can be identified as, uh, as uh, uh, intelligent agents that get that go and sit there and uh, literally it's over super, uh, that they, uh, they look at the supervised learning and make sure it's, so supervised learning goes beyond just the data, but also these intelligent agents and make sure things happen correctly. This is the formulation of the t TDM, if you want to put it in a, in a very simple, so it says that uh, the production of the well I is a function of a subset of all of these parameters. And I'll show you what these parameters are. These parameters are a dynamic characteristics of the well at time t, uh, a dynamic of offset producer at time t minus 1, dynamic uh, of offset injector at time t. Uh, this is static uh, characterization for well. This is the static characterization of offset producer, static characteristics of uh, offset injector, and then you have well-based and you have polygon-based, and this is static is a combination of both of them. And if you look at, sorry, 
if you could look at here, this is static information, dynamic information. This is the in, uh, injector well, offset producer, offset injectors. This is the the, uh, the well itself uh, at, at times t, but the producer at time t minus one, injector at, at time t. Uh, one of the, I'm going to finish it here because it's almost 40 minutes. Uh, this is going to be my last uh, model. The way we handle uh, validation, let's assume that we're going to, we have a field that we're dealing from the year 2000 to 2029. That's what we want to do. So, and the fact is, in this particular well, we, we go from uh, 20,000 uh, 20, to 2016, use all the measurement, well, and we build our history, uh, build and history match the model, and we actually have the data from till today, which is 2019 or end of 2019. Then we, we use that, those number of years and we use them as a, uh, as blind history match. And then if that works, then we will forecast it. So it's 40 minutes. I'm going to stop uh, uh, sharing my screen and uh, on uh, mute. Uh, I have just unmuted. Your line is now unmuted. So, uh, any question, I'd be happy to look at it. I'm now looking at the chat to see if there is any question. In the prediction step, what input did you provide uh, uh, other than location? The only input we provide during pr prediction is choke setting. And sometimes when you have wellhead, and these two are good, choke setting and wellhead. Sometimes only wellhead, sometimes only choke setting, and some other times choke setting and wellhead. If you operated uh, these wells different than the other wells used, train the model with the Well, the answer is yes. Uh, as long as uh, the inputs are the same thing, uh, for example, as, as long as the inputs are injection, injectors, uh, water injection, gas or CO2 injection, and uh, uh, different, uh, uh, of course, it has to be in the same range. But when you do uh, history matching on real world fields, you always have enough data in the range that can take care of that. Can you give some more detail in the SPM? Of course, I would be happy to do that, but uh, uh, it's uh, very hard uh, really to do that uh, uh, right now. As, uh, so smart proxy, literally everything that I said about TDM applies to smart proxy as well. Different is it does not, the data does not come from uh, uh, from real world, the data comes from a numerical reservoir simulation. And the beauty of it is, but the smart proxy is, or you almost guaranteed you're going to succeed because you have the option of do whatever you want and generate the, any type of uh, uh, any type of data that you would like to have. The next question is, have you tried some more complex neural network uh, morphologies, the LSTM and CNN? The answer is absolutely yes. Actually, maybe the math of uh, uh, LSTM uh, or RNN or CNN is different. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, uh, maybe the math is more complex, but they are not really more complex. They're actually more simple than a regular neural network. The reason for them being that LSTM and RNN, the rec recurrent neural network and long short-term memory uh, networks, these are purely uh, time-dependent uh, neural networks. They, if you go back and look at uh, their history and why they were developed prior you using it yourself, you'll find out that they were really developed mainly to, uh, to deal with, the, uh, uh, with language, specifically LSTM. Uh, they wanted to build uh, captioning for, for, for images, and they wanted to identify which part of the, uh, the, the words should be used and which parts should not be used. That's why they call it long-term and short-term. The short-terms are the data or the words that are used very closer to the next word that they're going to come up with. The long one are the oldest one. And then if you look at it, literally LSTM is like uh, 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 decline curve analysis in a little bit more complex fashion. And we, we did a lot of research using LSTM and TDM. And uh, if, because you have to include uh, the, the version of LSTM that they use, uh, and the algorithms are available in many of these uh, uh, libraries, we found out that are not very good uh, to do reservoir-related uh, data. It, you can actually get very good results for a single web only. 
uh, the space is completely gone and uh, you cannot do a lot of things that you have to do with those. Uh, I believe that it would provide better time, space, resolution, standard uh, network. LSTM does not, I'll guarantee you that. Uh, uh, at least based on the research that we have done for, for a few years. Uh, I, I'm sure you can do your own research and come to your own conclusion and I'll be happy to find out if I was incorrect. Uh, how do you decide the uh, important feature? The way you decide, I and mean, that's, a, that's a very good question, how you decide the important feature, it has to do the, uh, the key, one of the key issues with AI and machine learning has to do uh, the curse of dimensionality. Uh, the very large number of dimensions uh, or, or parameters that you have and you want to deal with. Uh, the, the issue actually is that we use, uh, we use uh, a fuzzy pattern recognition technology to identify which parameters to use. But, but one of what, what this, this is, a, again, this is one of the very key issues uh, uh, that, that uh, yeah, this is one of the key issues that's going to play a role. Uh, the next one is yes, but the Recurrent CNN can handle spatial temporal. Uh, okay, I'll be very interested to understand what is the recurrent CNN. If by CNN you mean convolutional neural network, convolutional neural network, when you go into the detail of it, it is a uh, signal processing plus neural network uh, that was done in order to do image recognition. And if you're doing image recognition, then it's a completely different story. Uh, you might be very successful with, with CNN. Uh, the key is uh, that, uh, at least uh, the way I approach uh, reservoir engineering, I don't look at it as, a, uh, as an image processing issue, it's a data processing issue. So when you do the choke setting optimization, how did you treat other variables? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand what that means when you choke setting. Uh, okay, so what we do choke setting, since that is an, uh, this, we just modify that and see I don't, and everything else stays the same in order to find out how choke setting impacts uh, the, the production. Uh, you update the static properties uh, dynamically, or these uh, properties are considered dynamic. In, no, they're not considered dynamic. They are, they are uh, porosity, permeability, gamma ray, density, V shale, all of these uh, uh, items are static information. But when we're developing the spatial temporal database, uh, it's not only the, the, my, the offset well that is impacting the production of the focal well, it is due to the range from where the offset well is to the where the focal well is. That area has a certain amount of uh, uh, value of gamma ray of porosity or the range that that polygon and since polygon changes as a function of time because the number of wells in changes as a function of time the number of uh, wells that you in, uh, produce or a producer that you drill or injectors that you drill they will change the polygon and although the the well the, the static information for the well doesn't change but since you're just using simple Krieging in order to generate the value uh, for the for the uh, polygon, that's what uh, it, it modifies. I don't know if I un understood and answered it correctly or not. You opted to say, okay, did you say the inputs are just choke setting and wellhead pressure? Yes, that's what I said. How are the information like logs? Uh, because the logs and well location, and uh, of course, well location is very very important. That that's not a uh, that that's that's something that you never change. If you drill a well, that that stays there. So that that information is always there. However, the logs and all of that stuff were used in order to build the model. So they have already uh, impacted the pattern that has been generated by by com com uh, a complex set of neural networks that created the patterns that there. But if for a particular well, as it happens, something in the future then all you have to do is to change the dynamic information because those static information do not change unless you drill new wells and it changes the polygon's value. Did you take a median value for other variables or did you optimize choke setting by each well? We, uh, we optimize choke setting by each well. Uh, do you lag your data sets so as to incorporate time? Uh, I don't know if I understand it. Uh, uh, what do you mean by that? Because the, uh, we use uh, 
we use t minus one and uh, t minus two sometimes uh, uh, for some of the uh, parameters. Now, if by lagging you mean creating those 3D, uh, that goes back to, to CNN and LSTM, which you have to create 3D uh, data. Uh, literally, you, you regenerate your data by moving them uh, one time step or two time step, and you use them. And uh, that, that we have done that a lot. Uh, we came to conclusion that that doesn't work well. That's why we, we stopped it. And that's our uh, research. I'm sure others are doing the research. If they are successful, then we'll be very happy to learn from them. Uh, okay, do you lag? Okay, next one is uh, how did uh, handle the risk with upscaling static model properties? How did it handle the risk with upscaling static model properties? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand what that means. Uh, there are, so what the, there is, uh, we don't upscale. Uh, the, the key for us that we don't do anything about is we use the measured data. Uh, given that for special temporal database that we generate, we have a uh, Cartesian uh, uh, grid behind that, uh, so we use a, a very simple, simple interpolation, very, very simple creating, without any uh, uh, interpretation. And we generate uh, these uh, data, uh, gamma ray, porosity, all the static information for that. And we, we call it a static model. That static model literally takes uh, 10 minutes to generate uh, after you have the data. It's literally nothing. That's why it's probably it's not a good idea to even call it a static or a geological model, because people who build geological model, they spend a very, very long amount of time to do that. And they spend a, a lot of uh, interaction. We don't do that. That's why it's, we don't really call the static model. This is just to make sure that the static data that we have and the measurements are playing a role in space uh, uh, that, that help uh, uh, build the top-down model. I think I got all the uh, questions that came through uh, the chat. I think, it, uh, I believe that uh, everybody is unmuted in order they need to uh, how many questions? There's eight minutes left. How would you, uh, oh, uh, how would output geology? Well, uh, the geology, the way uh, the one I showed you, is because one of the two of the outputs that we get are pressure, reservoir pressure, and uh, re uh, water saturation. So when you get them for different location at different times. Then you can map them, and that's how you get the geology. And in what I what I showed you actually, uh, when we show, when we when we presented that to that company, uh, they told us that uh, they're glad that we used their their uh, seismic input interpretation, which uh, identified uh, certain uh, uh, faults and certain. Uh, uh, high permeability uh, places, and we told them we did it. We did not use any of their interpretation. Uh, we just used actual data, and that is the pattern that came out of the uh, process. And that's why uh, uh, that's why the, how the geology works. So, can you do transfer learning from one field to another? That's a very very good question. That is something we're currently doing research on. I don't know the answer uh, the, to that question. My answer is uh, hopefully yes, uh, but I don't know how. We are, we, we, are, we are right now working on a project, and we're using that as a, uh, as a, uh, as a research uh, topic. Uh, uh, the transfer learning technology that's out there is not uh, for, for engineering-related uh, 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 process. The question is how do you modify in order to, so another qu question that was earlier asked about uh, convolutional neural network. What we do, we call it deconvolutional neural network because literally, what, uh, but what we've learned is from the convolutional neural network. One of the things we've learned is everything that people have been doing in Google and in Facebook and in uh, uh, other places which is non-engineering related AI and machine learning algorithm, when you deeply study them and understand what they do, 
One thing you find out you shouldn't be doing is applying it to engineering. But another thing you find out that you should be doing is to learn what was it that they were trying to solve and what, what did that technology that they generated, transfer learning is a good example of that, or even uh, convolution of the neural network, what did they do in order to address the problem that they were trying to solve? And when you learn that, then it gives you some guidelines of how to use those ideas, not those algorithms, but those ideas to apply it to these type of approaches and, 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 and solve the problems that you're looking for. And that is what we are trying to uh, address when it comes to transfer learning. I don't have an answer to it, but it's a topic that we are currently doing uh, 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 research on. You mentioned creating is used, but this requires sufficient data. That is true to model the biogram. Uh, that is true, but again, uh, that you cannot deal with anything other than the data that you have. So uh, usually when you have uh, 30, 40, in some cases hundreds of wells, uh, those locations will help you to, to build the model. And if it, even if it is not very, very correct, that, that's okay. Uh, as long as, because again, those things that are correct are the measured data. Uh, and, and you don't literally, or during the, the remember I talked about the uh, curse of dimensionality, when you deal with the dimension, identifying which dimensions you want to use, then you, you can figure out uh, whether uh, those polygon uh, uh, that were uh, static, uh, uh, static, uh, uh, the, 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 those uh, parameters, static parameters that was done uh, for the polygon based on these screening, the, if they don't work, they, the, 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 your, 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 your neural network is not going to use it. Uh, the next is, the, what is the deconvolutional neural network? I'm writing an article on that. The deconvolutional neural network literally is the following. Uh, it, because convolution, the word convolution means combining variables to one another, right? And what we're doing, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, historical data, you never find a historical data to include a straight, uh, uh, look like a, a decline curve analysis that comes from the numerical reservoir simulator, right? It's always up and down, up and down, up and down, a lot of, and those up and down, the data comes from, uh, the, from not from the nature, but from human beings the way we operate the, the wells, not from the uh, permeability and processing. So a deep convolutional neural network is a neural network that you provide all that uh, complex data to it, but then when you drill in a new location, it gives you a very nice, uh, without a lot of up and down, it, it looks like a very uh, simple uh, 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 decline curve analysis to uh, well something that you get from the uh, numerical reservoir simulator. Uh, that kind of, I, I had a, actually uh, something like that to show you, but the time didn't. So you're deconvolving the time and space. You deconvol you're deconvolving, uh, this neural network is deconvolving the change that porosity and permeability and static parameters have on the production and the impact that uh, choke setting and wellhead pressure and injection has on the parameter. That's why I call it deconvolutional. Can skin buildup versus time be taken into account? If you have that as an actual, because a lot of time skin is interpretation, has very, not as much to do with, uh, uh, with uh, actual measurement. But if you do have it as an actual measurement and you want to use it, the answer is yes, you can take it into account and include it. We have another minute to go at. I think uh, so. I think we're we're a couple minutes past three, but I I did want to thank you, Shahab, for uh, for the very interesting and uh, thought provoking um, presentation and, and discussion uh, uh, and, and uh, answering all those questions. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate the pleasure of all of that. So and th thanks to everyone else, and I uh, hope everyone has a, a a great weekend. Have a great day, everybody.